Memphis, Martin, and the Mountaintop, The Sanitation Strike of 1968, written by Alice Faye Duncan and illustrated by R. Gregory Christie. This story was mined from history books and the memories of a Memphis teacher. When she was a child, she marched in the Memphis sanitation strike with her mother and father. Men, women, and children contributed to the strike in 1968. Whole families sacrificed their comforts. They suffered for the cause. However, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. paid the highest cost. He gave his life to the struggle for freedom and justice. Memphis, 1968. I remember Memphis. I remember the stinking sanitation strike. Alley cats, rats, and dogs rummaged through piles of trash. Black men marched through Memphis with protest signs raised high. I also marched in 68 with red ribbons in my hair. I remember Memphis and legions of noblemen. I remember broken glass and the voice of a falling king. Fire, smoke, and ashes ravaged midnight cityscapes. Black men march for honor, and I must tell the story. You must tell the story so that no one will forget it. Mud Puddles The conflict started in January. Cold and wet with rain, poor wages for black sanitation workers sparked grumblings of a labor strike. In stormy February, death made the grumblings swell to a loud, blasting rage. I know. I was there as clouds covered the Memphis sky. I had skipped outside to splash and play on the sidewalk in mud puddles. Lorraine, Lorraine, Mama called my name. I could feel it. A punishment was on the way. But when Daddy ran up the porch, distressed and out of breath, Mama ignored my muddy shoes on her clean kitchen floor. Bad news traveled at lightning speed. There was a tragic accident on a Memphis garbage truck. Two black men working in the rain never made it home for dinner. Their names still live with me. Echo Cole and Robert Walker dumped garbage with my daddy. Several Memphis garbage trucks were old and unsafe. The trucks were not maintained. According to my daddy, a packer blade malfunctioned, crushing his friends. Daddy told Mama, it ain't right to die like that. Mama shook her head, and I saw a new storm rising up. I saw it in their eyes. Marching Orders Memphis sanitation workers shared one common trait. Like my daddy, most of the men were black. They carried rusted garbage barrels as slop dripped down their clothes. White managers called them ugly names, too ugly to repeat. The average pay for sanitation workers was $1.70 an hour. Daddy called it starvation pay. Even with a full-time job, he needed government help to buy groceries for our family. Sanitation workers formed a labor union to advocate their rights. Better pay seemed close at hand. The labor union encouraged better treatment and safety on the job. But the men faced opposition from Memphis mayor Henry Loeb. Tall like a giant and stubborn like a mule, Mayor Loeb said no to a pay increase. He did not acknowledge the Workers' Labor Union, the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, Local 1733. To insult the men even further, Mayor Loeb gave little assistance to the Cole and Walker families. When they could take the abuse no more, 1,300 men deserted their garbage barrels. They organized a labor strike on February 12, 1968. In the morning and afternoon, for 65 days, sanitation workers marched 14 blocks through the streets of downtown Memphis. From Claiborne Temple to the steps of City Hall, they squared their shoulders, raised their heads, and carried their picket signs. My daddy marched in that number. He marched for better pay. He marched for decent treatment. 
My daddy marched for me. Winter blues. The strike crippled garbage collection with terrific success. Replacement workers operated 38 garbage trucks while a whopping 180 trucks stayed parked at the city barn. Sidewalks turned unsightly by the end of February. Loose paper with crushed cans, empty boxes, and food scraps littered the Memphis streets. With daddy on the picket line and less money in the house, he rolled pennies to pay our rent. The phone bill went unpaid. One week, we had no lights. And when classmates visited the candy lady on their way home from school, they bought cookies, pickles, and peppermint sticks. I walked home empty-handed. That year, when I was nine years old, I learned what the grown folks knew. Trouble visits every life. But as strikers marched through sun and rain, help came in many forms. A group of Memphis preachers formed Community on the Move for Equality. The organization used church donations to help strikers pay their bills. The National Association for the Advancement of Colored People organized boycotts to support the strike. My mama answered their call. In her right hand, she carried her boycott sign. In her left, she held my hand. Together, we marched past downtown stores with shiny storefront windows. Pretty shoes made me smile, but mama's money stayed in her purse, and I wore old shoes all winter. Trouble. Every night, Daddy drove his blue jalopy to jam-packed rallies where strikers sang freedom songs. We shall overcome. We shall overcome. We shall overcome someday. Music lightened the heavy mood. Daddy clapped his large black hands. He also listened to Memphis preachers who plotted out strike strategies and delivered fiery speeches to encourage the striking men. As winter turned into spring, experienced union leaders with AFSCME flew into Memphis from Washington, D.C. They spoke with the striking workers as advocates and strategists. Still, nothing changed. The mayor railed, no, to every labor request, and my daddy kept right on marching. One night, as I finished homework in the dark by fading candlelight, Mama pleaded, William, maybe you should quit the strike and go on back to work. Daddy hugged Mama tightly. Gladys, he insisted, we gotta hold on till the end. Then I heard him promise, trouble don't last always. Martin. My daddy was a sanitation worker. My mama was a maid. Neither one of them read very well or finished high school. Lifting garbage and cleaning houses was all the work they could find. When mama's boss paid her wages on Friday afternoons, he also put magazines and newspapers in her carry bag. Mama gave the papers to me. I would read the headlines to both my parents, and we'd follow the strike. I read the headlines that early March when strike negotiations failed, but as Daddy's soles wore thin on his mountain climb, there came a spark of light. Good news filled the air. Reverend James Lawson, a C-O-M-E advisor, called his old friend Martin to Memphis. The headlines encouraged my parents. Daddy buzzed around the house. Dr. King is coming to town. Mama told Miss Brooks, our neighbor, girl, I can't believe it. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. practiced nonviolent protests. He was a champion for social change who marched for racial equality across Mississippi, Alabama, and Washington, D.C. It was his persistent demand for justice that inspired President Lyndon B. Johnson to help abolish segregation and sign the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Since Martin had conquered giants in the Valley of Injustice, Reverend Lawson believed his powerful friend could help the striking men. That was my silent prayer as I leaned against my daddy's knee and read the news out loud. Silver Rights I did not plainly comprehend this trouble I saw in 1968. Wisdom came slowly over the mounting years. But when I look back now, I understand. The Memphis struggle was an economic fight. 
better wages and pay were a matter of civil rights. Poverty was a civil war. My daddy and his friends were the working poor. The men sought better wages to feed their families and buy decent homes, not run-down shanties like our rented house. As public servants, sanitation workers deserved better pay to educate their children and give them a future bright with hope. This was the message Dr. King preached when he arrived in Memphis on March 18th. He said, all labor has dignity. Dr. King's voice was loud and stirring. I listened with my parents from a crowded church pew as the famous leader drafted a plan to march in Memphis with the striking men. Dr. King set a date for March 22nd. Daddy leaned toward Mama's ear. He said, we need everybody to march that day. Mama did not waver. She assured Daddy, I'll take off work. You can count on me. Then Mama patted my hand and said, we will take Lorraine. She can march with us. Omen, yellow daffodils, 16 inches under snow. King canceled his march. Bill Street. I followed Dr. King during the nightly news on our black and white TV. As president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference in Atlanta, Georgia, he cared deeply for America's working poor. Dr. King set out to abolish poverty in the very same way he had raised his voice to abolish racial segregation. He wanted to strengthen labor laws for all Americans and to make his dream come true. He planned a massive march in Washington, D.C. in the spring of 1968. Dr. King named this new crusade the Poor People's Campaign. As he traveled the nation to promote his plans, King drew national attention to the Memphis strike. He called it a small conflict that presented a big American problem. From coast to coast, and especially in the South, public servants and unskilled laborers like my parents were often underpaid and reduced to poverty. When the strange snow cleared, Dr. King rescheduled his Memphis protest for March 28th. Mama kept me home from school so I could march that day. We stood together with other mothers and children at the back of the protest line, away from possible danger. My daddy stood tall at the front of the line with striking workers and clergy like Reverend Lawson and Dr. King. Daddy and his friends also carried picket signs bearing four words, I am a man. With or without a pay increase, they demanded Mayor Loeb's respect. 6,000 people, blacks, whites, men, women, and children, gathered in downtown Memphis. Police stood guard with tear gas, billy clubs, and guns. Fifteen minutes into the march, there was a sound of breaking glass. Looters threw bricks and sticks up and down Bill Street. They shattered storefront windows as strikers and strike supporters scattered their way to safety. Police sprayed tear gas and beat guilty people. They beat innocent people, too. Blood spattered everywhere. It was difficult to see, and I was separated from my mama. I yelled, Mama, where are you? Daddy found me on the curb. He scooped me up, and we ran to a nearby church. Mama lost her hat and gloves, but she managed to reach us safely. It was never proven, but rumors said militant teenagers started the Bill Street riot. As for the Memphis Morning Paper, it called Dr. King a coward because he ran from the violence and was carted away safely in a stranger's passing car. The news reports disturbed my father. He raised his fist and fumed, Dr. King is a bona fide man. Mama rubbed her feet and sighed. Sometimes bad people mess things up for the good people doing good. Trucks and tanks. Mayor Loeb issued a state of emergency in response to the Bill Street riot. He imposed a 7 p.m. curfew and called for 4,000 National Guard soldiers to patrol the Memphis streets in military trucks and tanks. The presence of soldiers restored the peace. But on the following day, the strike seemed to have no end. Mayor Loeb held firmly to his anti-union position, and workers continued to march. 
the sight of loaded guns did not send them back to work. From my bedroom window, I saw soldiers in big green tanks creep slowly up the street. I waved to my friend Jan, who sat in her window too. Nobody played outside that day. Fear locked us in our houses. Dreamers. Dreamers don't quit. When challenges arise, dreamers keep on climbing. My daddy was a dreamer. Dr. King was a dreamer too. When the Memphis March turned into a riot, the disappointed leader left the city, but he promised to return. He promised to lead a peaceful march in support of the striking workers. And as Dr. King made new plans to protest, death threats rattled his ears. Somebody wanted to kill his dream of economic freedom for the working poor. Threats did not stop his mountain climb. On April 3rd, 1968, Dr. King kissed his wife and children. He left his Atlanta home and boarded a flight to Memphis. I was there on that stormy night, Dr. King returned. Clouds blotted out stars in the Memphis sky. Wind whipped through the bending trees. My daddy beamed with hope when he told Mama, Dr. King is going to preach tonight at Mason Temple Church. In Daddy's blue jalopy, we sputtered through pounding rain. We chugged through bursts of lightning and the shrill of tornado sirens. When we entered the church, a preacher named Abernathy stood at the microphone. Ralph Abernathy was Dr. King's best friend. On that stormy night, he delivered terrible news. Dr. King was sick and resting in a motel room. Rain-soaked faces grumbled. My daddy did not drive through sheets of rain for Ralph Abernathy. He came to hear Dr. King. As the crowd listened to the speeches about the strike, I slept in Mama's arm. Kaboom! A voice like the evening thunder shook me from my sleep. It was Dr. King, like Moses on the mountain. He charged men, women, and children to make the world a promised land flowing with freedom and justice. Like a man preaching his own funeral, Dr. King used vivid words to paint the story of his life. He described his challenges and triumphs during the civil rights movement. And in the face of death threats, Dr. King spoke boldly. He encouraged Memphis strikers and strike supporters to march, boycott, and raise their voices for worker rights until victory was won. His voice boomed. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we, as a people, will get to the promised land. The crowd rose up with a deafening shout. My daddy yelled, Amen. My mama yelled, Praise the Lord. An old man hollered, We can't stop now. Dreamers never quit. Lorraine. My name is Lorraine, like the Memphis Motel. Many years have passed, but the building still stands. The Lorraine Motel is a storied shrine. Dr. King shared his last meal and rested there on April 4, 1968. The leader spent his last hour on the second floor in room 306, where he talked with Ralph Abernathy and Samuel Cowles. They joked and laughed the way good friends do. And they spoke of plans for an evening rally with the striking workers. The laughter did not last for long. Evil showed its ugly head as James Earl Ray hunkered down in the open window of a boarding house. Perched 70 yards from the Lorraine Motel, the escaped convict pointed his rifle at room 306 and waited. He saw his target at one minute past six. Dr. King stepped on the balcony where he greeted friends in the parking lot. Ray fired his gun and a bullet pierced the dreamer's neck. News of Dr. King's assassination spread quickly. In Washington, D.C., Chicago, and Baltimore, young people expressed their grief with looting and raging fires. Mayor Henry Loeb called for the return of the National Guard. There was not much looting in Memphis, but a fire branded me as I stretched across my bed and listened to radio station WDIA. Between finger-snapping hits by Aretha Franklin and James Brown, 
The black disc jockey cried for the loss of Dr. King. I cried too when Dr. King was shot. I also wrote a poem in my school notebook. Writing served me better than breaking glass. And Mama posted my poem on the crumbling wall of our rented house. The King is Dead by Lorraine Jackson. Not long ago, there lived a king. He did not sleep in a castle. He did not wear a crown. He did not rule a royal court or ride in chariots. The king marched in the streets. He lived to help the poor. He lived for peace and love. Hate killed the king. The king is dead. What will the people do? Black Widow Coretta Scott King flew to Memphis committed to a plan. Dr. King had pledged to support the sanitation strike with a nonviolent march. Despite her broken heart, Mrs. King and members of SCLC helped to keep her husband's pledge on April 8, 1968. The memorial march served as a tribute to honor Dr. King's life. It also reminded Mayor Loeb that workers would strike and continue their upward climb until justice was received. In a wave of 40,000 people, I marched that day between my mama and daddy. Those who marched with us were ministers, labor leaders, political figures, entertainers, and everyday people from Memphis and around the nation. Nobody spoke a word. We raised our protest signs. Honor King, end racism, union justice now. Mrs. King marched from Memphis. Behind a veil of mourning, she buried her love in Georgia. Victory on a Blue Note The Memphis sanitation strike ended on April 16, 1968. Mayor Loeb never bargained with the workers. President Lyndon B. Johnson sent James Reynolds, a top U.S. labor official, to negotiate a settlement. Reynolds brokered an agreement between the sanitation workers and the Memphis City Council. In the final deal, the city of Memphis recognized the workers' labor union. The men received a pay increase of 15 cents an hour, and they were promised job promotions based on merit, not race. I remember that glad day the stinking strike came to an end. It was the Tuesday after Easter. Daddy marched proudly into the house and smiled at Mama and me. He picked me up, kissed my face, and cried in Mama's neck. Mama squeezed us tightly as tears filled her eyes. So much was won, so much was lost. Freedom is never free. Mountaintop. Dream big, walk tall, be strong, march on. Don't quit, never stop. Climb up the mountaintop. Oh,